Maybe you have a memory like this, something on VHS maybe, or a DVD that you watched over and over and over. I think for me, it would have to be Bugs Bunny on Looney Tunes, old VHS tapes. What's up, Jack? My producer, Lee, was saying that for her, it's the trailer for The Proud Family. And for my next guest, Esme Weijin Wang, it was this particular scene from Dawson's Creek. I can't. I can't choose. You have to choose. And I'm begging you from the bottom of my heart to please choose me. I wasn't quite sure at the time what it was that fascinated me so much about this scene, but I think it was, you know, part of it was just this interest in the angst of the scene. But the other part of it was really wishing that I had somebody in my life who cared enough about me to plead with me to be well. Esme is the author of a couple of books, most recently the bestseller The Collected Schizophrenias, an essays collection about her own experience being diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder. I first met Esme about a year and a half ago when she so graciously did an event for my book, A Kind of Miraculous Paradise, and I am just thrilled to have her on Mad Chat today talking about this one scene from Dawson's Creek. This is Mad Chat, a podcast where we unpack what our pop culture is telling us about madness and mental health. I'm your host, Sandy Allen. This week, I'm very excited to be discussing the show that gave the internet the glorious gift that is the Dawson ugly cry meme, Dawson's Creek. I don't want to wait for our lives to be over. And here to have a chat with me is the incredible Esme Weijin Wang. Esme, welcome to Mad Chat. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. So when I've been talking with various, uh, you know, potential guests uh, for Mad Chat, um, some people, you know, don't know right away what they want to discuss. But you, you knew not only what show you wanted to discuss, but a particular episode in that show, a particular scene almost in that episode. Um, and so, yeah, I admit I hadn't actually seen a minute of Dawson's Creek um, before you suggested it, though I have watched a lot of it now. Um, and so for those uh, listeners who have, you know, never seen it or have somehow managed to get the, you know, title song out of their head, um, Dawson's Creek was a series about teens that was that aired on the WB uh, from 1998 to 2003. And it had a lot of actors in it who made me say, oh, they're from Dawson's Creek, like uh, James Vanderbeek, Katie Holmes, Joshua Jackson, Michelle Williams. Um, and the show follows Dawson, who's this Spielberg-obsessed, aspiring filmmaker, teenager boy who lives near a creek, <laughs> and his crew of friends and sometimes girlfriends as they progress through high school, having crushes and feelings and also talking about crushes and talking about feelings. And so Esme, the particular episode that you wanted to talk about is from the second season, episode 20. It's called Reunited. And it has to do with um, a character named Andy McPhee. Um, you mentioned this was an episode that you watched over and over. Take us back in time. Who were you when you first watched Dawson's Creek or this particular episode? Like how old were you and what was your life like? Yeah, so now that you mention it, knowing that the show started in 1998, there are so many things that strike me as so bonkers to think about. I mean, Dawson's Creek had the first gay kiss in it. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, 1998 seems like a long time ago, but it wasn't actually that long ago. Yeah. So I, um, I was, let's see, 1998. So I was maybe a freshman in high school. I was a teen and I was going through a lot of mental health issues. And so I started watching this show. I didn't 
become so obsessed with it that I watched all the seasons. But the first few seasons definitely caught my attention. And I particularly became intrigued by, as you mentioned, the character of Andy McPhee, who is played by Meredith Monroe. And um, the, the episode that I was particularly interested in was called Reunited, and it's in season two. And I taped it on um, VHS, and I remember just watching it in my bedroom um, where I had a little TV and a little uh, VCR, and Mm -hmm. I would just watch that episode over and over again. And it was so funny because I had suggested that we watch this episode and talk about it um, for this podcast, but I hadn't rewatched it since, you know, the uh-huh. late 90s. Uh-huh. Um, but in rewatching it, I realized that I had not forgotten any of it. I mean, every like beat by beat, like the emotions, like the the details, the kind of the way that actors spoke and paused and moved, like all of it was really burned into my you know, into my memory because yeah. it had such an impact on me. And, you know, in in reading your notes about the show, I feel like it's so funny that this was made such an impact on my impressions about mental illness because there were some really uh, strange things that uh, Dawson's Creek purported to uh, depict about yeah mental illness. Yeah, I'm I really I want to get into that. Let's um let's explain a little bit if you wouldn't mind like who Andy McPhee is and kind of what this what this uh scene is that we're talking about. Sure. So Andy McPhee is this very brainy character. She's type A, loves to get good grades. She's known in the small town for having a crazy mother yeah. um who Um, it seems went crazy or had some sort of nervous breakdown after killing her son um, in a car accident. I mean, she's not always like this. I mean, sometimes she's fine, but you just never know. And I'm the only one who can handle her. And sometimes that just gets really hard. So part of Andy's responsibilities is caring for her mother, who is kind of this mysterious figure uh um in the upstairs uh yeah yeah she's mostly upstairs know. yeah <laughs> she's like an yeah upstairs she's mostly character. upstairs yeah. <laughs> yeah it's like the muppet babies like yeah. the, the, it's like, <laughs> um with um with the nanny anyway um so uh andy mcphee uh starts to date uh pacey witter who is the the kind of wild boy of the yeah. creek josh um, jackson the sh- yeah joshua jackson and when the show starts, uh, Pacey is, you know, having sex with one of the teachers at, I know. Um, at the school. Yeah. And Whoa, so, um, but- I was so blown away <laughs> by that. Like, I was like, oh, my gosh, this show was like raunchy, but also the social attitudes towards an adult sleeping with a 14, 15 year old child sure have shifted. I felt like such a such a stick in the mud, too. Every time the teenagers would talk about having sex, I was like, oh, my gosh, like, you know, anyway, I felt like such a such a prude and also such an adult. Um, oh, so yeah. Pacey, <laughs> so <laughs> Pacey, Pacey falls for Andy and they have this relationship and she kind of helps turn him around, you know. Yeah. And um, they're like super in love. They have like the, yeah, they're the most love. beautiful love that we've ever seen, you know, style love. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But then um, something something very catastrophic happens um, in in the town, which is that this character, Abby, dies. Yeah. And even before Abby dies, Andy is kind of having some problems. And we learn that she is perhaps on medication, on medication on and off. The medications that she's on vary, or the the names of the medications that she's on vary. And I was very intrigued by this. I think Nardal was named, which I think is yeah. an MAOI in- <laughs> inhibitor, yeah. MA- MAO inhibitor, which is, you know, uh, very rarely used now. And then also Xanax is described as an as an anti-anxiety, antidepressant, which right. I do not think anybody would describe Xanax as. An antidepressant. And it's Joshua Jackson who says that. Hey, please, just give it back. Uh, 
Andrea McPhee, take two tablets daily as directed. Xanax, 20 milligrams. Xanax, that's, uh, that's for severe depression and anxiety, right? It's like Prozac. I was like, wow, since when did this character know, like, how to identify a psychiatric drug? It felt so, it reminded me a lot of, like, when Ice-T knows everything on Law & Order SVU. Like, it just had this sort of, like, there's not terribly believable. Yes, but I also noticed that the sort of, like, name of what she was on sort of shifted around a little bit in the lead up to the, you know, the the sequence. And, and Abby also, I mean, one of the things about her, she's this really, like, loathed character, and then she dies, and then everyone kind of has struggles with what to do with that but she particularly bullies Andy like she is mm -hmm. running against Andy in the student council or the sophomore class elections or whatever and she says on the stage all of this stuff about Andy's mom about Andy's mom killing you know the brother about so the fact of the matter is mommy McPhee is a whacked out nut and we all know that mental illness is hereditary there's a very clear like, ooh, we shouldn't trust you because your mom is crazy. You know, there's this really yeah. big, vicious, you know, public humiliation that happens to to Andy on stage and she like rushes off and such. And then pretty soon after, Abby is dead and Andy is sort of yes. thrust into eulogizing her by her, like Abby's mother. Um <laughs> And so, yeah, this is all like kind of in the in the background. And then as as we get toward that, that um, episode reunited, um, you know, wh what happens? Uh, who Who is she reunited with? Um, she is reunited with dun dun dun, her dead brother, Tim. <laughs> um, and so, you know, something that I guess Dawson's Creek is trying to tell us is that if you if you are depressed and anxious, um, and or just crazy, you may just see uh, your dead brother appear and just, you know, chat, chat with him. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so in the beginning of the episode, the first thing that you notice is that uh, Andy has dyed her blonde hair brown. Right. Um, and I, and you, I thought you might have something to say about that. <laughs> thought you might have something to say about that i mean it's such a trope right it's like a mm -hmm. it happens in crazy ex-girlfriend too like when she sort of is the most uh kind of vengefully going after her ex she dyes her hair darker brunette and then when she sort of settles back down it goes back to normal and andy mcphee there's sort of a similar thing right she dyes her hair right as this episode starts and as soon as it's happened i was like oh here we go. Um, and uh, but yeah, you've written quite a bit about, you know, appearance, especially like women's appearances and the way that we sort of have prejudices to do with different diagnoses. And I was curious to hear your thoughts about the way, you know, the show is like, oh, Andy has dyed her hair. In my book, I talk a lot about using um, appearance as some sort of defense or some form of um, weaponization against what other people might think of you. And here, that's not so much what Andy is doing as much as it is a symptom of what she's going through. Because, you know, so she appears and Jack, her brother, and Pacey are kind of walking alongside her. And she is just kind of flippantly telling Pacey, you don't like my new hair. And he's like, oh, no, no, no. Uh, I'm not saying that. It's just different. And then as soon as she walks away... Um, Jack tells him it's the hair. Okay, she's extra sensitive. She did herself. So it's it's very much a sign of something gone wrong. So when the show is showing Tim, um, you write in uh, in one of your essays in the book. You write about um, John Nash and a beautiful mind and sort of the way that um, his experiences are handled by that movie. And I was thinking about that as I was um, thinking about Tim's depiction here. But you know, how does this um, you know how does this make sense to you or not? How does this uh, how does this square with your experiences of psychosis or your sort of like your knowledge of it versus you know how much is this just like a Hollywood misinterpretation. Yeah, um, I feel like it's both similar and dissimilar to the John Nash situation in A Beautiful Mind. So in my essay, Reality on Screen in um, The Collected Schizophrenias, I talk about how I had originally watched A Beautiful Mind and um, 
felt that the depiction of John Nash's hallucinations was absolutely ridiculous. And that's how I was meant to watch it. I'd watched it in an abnormal psychology class at Yale. And the depiction of his hallucinations, you know, his his buddy, you learn in this kind of like M. Night Shyamalan twist that this best friend has been fake all yeah. along. It's just yeah. been this elaborate... Um, elaborate hallucination. The prodigal roommate revealed. Saw my name on the lecture slate. You lied, son of a bitch! Who are you talking to? Tell me who you see. How do you say Charles Herman in Russian? How do you say in Russian? There's no one there, John. There's no one there. He's right there. The class uh, kind of talked about uh, how this was absolutely not how hallucinations work. And that's absolutely not how my hallucinations have worked. Hallucinations are not like that. They're not kind of continuous in that way. They don't have that kind of, it's just, it's just absolutely not the way that I've experienced hallucinations during psychosis. However, um, what I ended up concluding or thinking about in the essay is that it is a good way to depict delusions because mm -hmm. in order to convince the viewer, in the case of A Beautiful Mind, of this situation of uh, you know John Nash being recruited by the CIA for all of these uh, nefarious purposes, um, we need to believe that uh, the Ed Harris character is actually uh, a real person and is actually trying to get him to do certain things. Right. So uh, in that way, it's actually pretty effective. Mm -hmm. So I, I ended up giving the movie more credit than I had originally given it. So we can kind of look at uh, the, the Tim character uh, in uh, this episode of Dawson's Creek and kind of think about whether or not it, he plays a similar role, and I would have to say he does not, mm -hmm. because we know we know from the get go that Tim is dead. Yeah. So we are not we are not going to be fooled into thinking that that this Tim character is uh, is actually there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so he is he is there. Um, he's played by this uh, handsome brown haired dude, um, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and you know, uh, Pacey is at her house um, in uh, in close to the pivotal scene of the of the show and the scene that I watched over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. um, and he hears Andy talking to herself. He, he hears her talking to someone named Brown and he doesn't know who that is. And right. I think, d doesn't he like talk to Jack about this? Or yeah, he and Jack about, sort like, of have a yeah. debrief. Last night. I caught her talking to herself. I mean, she said she wasn't, but I heard her. So did I. Tonight, I mean, she was in the kitchen, and I thought she was talking to somebody on the phone. Talking with who? I, I don't know. I mean, I didn't hear the whole conversation, but it sounded like she was talking to someone named Brown. And then she interrupts them and is like, it was a nickname for Tim. It was the color of his hair. And, you know, and, and there's sort of this. But I think your point there, like that the show doesn't at all try to like that. There is no M. Night Shyamalan twist in this episode. Like there is no extent to which the audience believes that Tim is alive and real along with Andy, that it's 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 a it's it, they are casting a real actor. He's playing. You know, he's like in the scene with her, literally, he's hugging her in a car. Um, and yet mm -hmm. we are meant to understand this is not real. And I, I guess I wondered, too, I mean, the appearance of Tim in a mirror is another device that they use more than once as well, um, you know, where she'll look in the mirror and then she'll see him in the mirror. Um, and it, it seemed like there was an, a, a real attempt to make it like... Uh, it was definitely meant to be scary, right? Like we were meant to yes. sort of see this and be like, <gasps> like the first time it happens, she's gone to Abby's bedroom to steal her diary to keep Abby's mom from reading how mean <laughs> Abby was to her own mom. And then, like this is a girl who she like didn't like. And then she like looks in the mirror and sees Tim. And the show was definitely playing up like the the fear of it. The horror. Yeah. So the scene that had such an impact on me and the one that I watched over and over again um, when I was a teenager 
is one where Andy runs down the stairs and into the bathroom and she locks herself in the bathroom. And the, the scene becomes a kind of battle, battle of wills, of wills um, between Tim, the uh, hallucination, and Pacey, who is outside the bathroom door begging Andy to choose him. Go away! I'm not going anywhere, Andy. Not you, Tim! Is he in there right now? Is Tim in there with you? I said go! Jack! You're not real! <laughs> God! Andy! Andy is just like, you know, this crazy girl. She's a mess. She's in tears. She keeps, you know, seeing Tim. Tim is trying to coax her into choosing him. We're not really sure what that means, but I guess it means right. some kind of like becoming more crazy or choosing insanity. Um, <laughs> Pacey says something like, You are so special, and you give so much to everybody around you. And you know what, Andy? I need you more than Tim does. It's, it's a very intense scene, and Jack is very useless in this scene. He's just kind of hanging around. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uselessly behind Pacey. Um, and so finally, um, in the end, uh, the tear-stained Andy slowly reaches up and grabs uh, the doorknob and opens the uh, bathroom door and collapses into Pacey's arms and is sobbing. Yeah. Um, and so, so she has chosen uh, Pacey and not the hallucination slash insanity. Yeah, and she breaks the mirror, right? She, she, she. Oh yes, yes. She, she's been seeing Tim in the mirror, which is this, you know, kind of like horror trope. But she smashes the mirror, which is kind of like makes Pacey and Jack on the other side of the door even more alarmed. So, I'm curious, what about this scene? What was your reaction to it? Um, what What fascinated you about it, or what are your thoughts I think, on it now? I, you know, yeah, like I. I wasn't quite sure at the time what it was that fascinated mm. me so much about this scene, but I think it was, you know, part of it was just this interest in the angst of the scene. But the other part of it was really wishing that I had somebody in my life who cared enough about me to plead with me to, you know, uh, to be well. Mm -hmm. um, at the time, I had been self-harming for mm -hmm. a number of years. And by this time, I hadn't started seeing a psychiatrist yet, but I had been struggling with anxiety and depression for a while. Um, it, it just was something that I uh, could identify with in some ways. I really identified with the Andy McPhee character. I was a massive overachiever. Um, I lived in a small town. Um, I was not white, so that was a different thing. Um, but I, uh, I really felt for her and I, yeah, um, I really wanted a Pacey of my own, not necessarily romantically, although I'm sure that was part of it, but just somebody who cared enough to want to beg for my sanity outside yeah. of a bathroom door. Yeah, it's interesting. Pacey is, um, uh, he's an interesting person in this show in that even I'm thinking about that first scene where um, Andy's mom is, there's something going on at a grocery store and she's sort of summoned there and she begs them not to call the police and she and Pacey show up and it's Pacey who's sort of able to get, you know, um, Andy's mom to kind of like come with him. What are you doing here? You're picking up some groceries? I don't know. I don't I don't know. Hey, don't worry about it. You're fine. Just have me pick out a couple things. Uh, hey, <laughs> check it out marshmallows. It's a food group all on its own. Uh, you don't want that. I have some turkey and some roast beef in the fridge. He's sort of identified as being this, like, really caring listener who's able to approach someone who's maybe in another, you know, state of mind with a lot of like compassion. Um, and it is very striking how, you know, how much he really expresses love and support of Andy, even as as um, her experiences start to frighten him. 
Yeah, exactly. I mean, he is kind of the hero of the show, even though he is the bad boy. I mean, nobody was really cheering for Dawson. Um, no. even though <laughs> Dawson's he, the he, worst. He is the... <laughs> I, I mean, I was talking with... Um, my partner about uh, being on this podcast and I mentioned that it was going to be about Dawson's Creek and he he says something about uh, Dawson being the hero of the show and I kind of exploded like no Dawson was not the hero of the show and <laughs> and uh, he said well it wasn't it his creek uh, isn't that the titular creek and I, I was like no no um, Pacey uh, Pacey is the hero of the show I mean Pacey and en- is the one who ends up with Joey the Katie Holmes right character at the end of the show um, but yeah, uh, there was this idea in the kind of Pacey Andy relationship where there's the the bad boy who is kind of an outsider, um, and the the good girl who is also an outsider because mm-hmm. of her mental illness, kind mm-hmm. of like coming together. And you know, later in in other episodes, uh, they they end up breaking up after she goes to the uh, a mental hospital or a psychiatric uh, hospital. Yeah. But uh, in that moment, they are very close. And in the a- episode after that one, um, it's this very loving kind of parting as she has to leave because of her illness. Yeah, they they have a really difficult decision. And she ultimately decides. Um, at first, it seems like she's going to be kind of forcibly taken away from Pacey and her life and, and put in a hospital. But then she actually resolves that she wants to go. And she, you know, says a farewell to Pacey that's really emotional um, before she goes to the hospital for the summer. Um And, uh, you know, so I wondered, you know, in terms of the way the show is, uh, is, is showing Andy's experiences, what about it strikes you as, you know, kind of important to show or accurate or believable? And what about it strikes you as, um, I guess, for lack of a better word, problematic or resting on false stereotype? Oh, such a good question. I mean, this is, you know, uh, looking back on it. Uh, gosh, it, it's not even 10 years, it's 20 years ago. Um, 20 years ago, uh, you know, things were different in a lot of ways. And actually, a lot of things haven't changed. So I do find it interesting that in the end, you know, as a narrative technique, um, Andy decides to go of her own free will. Mm. She's not involuntarily committed. Right. Um, I think that would have made the show a lot more difficult. Um, And uh, so, um, or I think that would have made um, viewers a lot more upset. And and so they made that narrative choice. Right. Um, In terms of whether I think that they could have done things differently or um, whether the character should have been rendered differently, I mean... It was a soap opera, a teenage soap opera in like the late 90s, early thousands. And I did not and do not hold such high expectations for it. I think a a show that (laughs) I think a show, though, that like I watched later um, and think that like portrayed mental illness in a slightly more realistic way um, was the the newer Degrassi, like uh, mm. not the one, mm-hmm. uh, not the original one, but the the one that ended up having the the Drake, yeah, yeah, <laughs> the yeah. Drake character, yeah. And, um, because I kind of obsessively watched that one for a while, and it had a character who had bipolar disorder, and it also had a character who self harmed, and that one felt a lot more realistic. Um, the Andy McPhee character is very um, dramatic. Uh, in the way that a soap opera is meant to be dramatic. Um, Right. And I think it was appropriate for me at the time and what I needed. I don't think watching it harmed me in any particular way, although it perhaps romanticized mental illness in a way Hmm. that could have been problematic. I don't know. What do you think? Well, I wondered, I guess, about the hospital that she goes to. I mean, so one of the things about Andy is she's like got a wealthy father who's like in Providence, which is somewhere else. And um, and so when she eventually acquiesces to go to, into treatment, um, she we, we see a moment of that hospital when she's being picked up by Pacey and her sort of infidelity mm-hmm. is being found out. And it seems like a mansion country club 
type thing. Um, and she's like resting on a big four poster bed. It has this like, it very much looks like she's stayed at like a cool B and B is sort of the look of it, which I guess mm-hmm. just said to me, like she's spectacularly wealthy and, or I think this is like, you're alluding to this. I think like the show can only show a version of mental health care. It has to show a version that is like, um, you admit your problem, you go to the hospital, you arrive back at your life better. Um, like after that, there is no recurrence of Tim. Um, there's a lot of like, I think it has to be that tidy. It has to be like a good experience. She can't go into the hospital, not of her own volition and disagree with being in the hospital for the entire time and be like forcibly medicated. Like that can't be on the WB. Is that kind of like uh, when you're when you're referring to kind of like the way that, you know, the, the that her, you know, agreeing to go into the hospital is sort of a, a better narrative move for the show than like her being taken against her will? Yes, exactly. And I think that you mentioning how the hospital itself is portrayed is such a good point, too. The whole like country club description is so perfect. It, it reminded me of descriptions of like the kind of rehabs that mm-hmm. really wealthy Hollywood people would go to. Um, you know, my experiences of being involuntarily hospitalized have always been very traumatizing um, and scary. There is a lot that, you know, is out of your control. There's uh, a, a really serious lack of autonomy. I really do not see how one could uh, end up having an affair or infidelity (laughs) within the walls of a psychiatric uh, hospital, but she somehow manages to do it. Um, Yeah. uh, So uh, yeah, that is a really good point. Um, And yeah, the hospital is glossed over just as the hospitalization is glossed over just as uh, the the kind of more ugly parts of uh, her illness are glossed over. Yeah, and and as you're pointing out, like this is a genre thing in part, an audience thing in part. I'm sure they they know they can like edge up to certain topics that are perceived as racy, but they feel like they can't go over whatever that line is. But I do think it's interesting, right? That like the show is very unequivocally like it's it's telling us one story about Andy, and um, it's telling us another story about Jack, her brother, who's you know the gay character who come comes out despite this kind of like prejudiced dad and over time by doing things like joining the football team um wins his dad's <laughs> so you know he like puts on a uniform and his dad's like wait a minute i have a son after all and it's like oh, oh my God. Oh. but i you know it is yeah. interesting like what what is what is that line according to the values of like a show like this in the late 90s because a place like a you know this is where the likes of you for example was learning about mental illness was learning about psychiatric treatment was learning about how, you know, the the community around you, for example, would react to these ideas. In this society, a mention of mental illness is enough to, like, make everyone go, (gasps) but I wonder, you know, when when we've got these sort of um, romanticized or sort of fantasies of these things kind of being sold as if, you know, this is the way it would be, when, I don't know, in the late 90s and now, I don't think the experience that Andy has is necessarily the experience that someone's going to have who decides of their own accord to enter a psychiatric hospital. Like as you write about, people enter hospitals all the time voluntarily, but then become regarded as involuntarily there. And you can often lose your ability to leave even if you walked in the doors of your own accord. Yeah, that's what happened to me um, the third time that I was involuntarily hospitalized. I walked in voluntarily and then had my uh, status shifted. One of the things that you are writing about in several essays in The Collected Schizophrenias is the relationship between psychosis and violence, especially like the public perception of the relationship between those two things. Um, The first words of the first essay in the collection are schizophrenia terrifies, um, which is a line that I read as having multiple meanings, one of which is this, um, you know, the reaction that, that people have to the concept of schizophrenia. Um, and I, I think a lot about, you know, the, this perception of violence and psychosis, especially. And I was reading this interview with the guy, Alex Berenson, the journalist who wrote this 
book that's popular also this year called Tell Your Children, which is about cannabis and psychosis and, you know, basically is making an argument that's like reefer madness 2.0. But he has this quote in this interview that he's saying like, schizophrenics have a have a homicide rate that's 20 times normal and i was spending time afterwards <laughs> yeah, i was trying to figure out like what he is even referring to i was like where are you even coming up with something like this but i was then thinking yeah. about it doesn't really matter because it's mostly like he's used whatever data to support his notion which is like psychosis equals scary bad Hey, it's Sandy. I wanted to briefly interrupt myself to say, if you want to hear way more about this book we've just mentioned and its problematic claims, might I recommend the previous episode of this podcast, episode four, where I interview uh, cannabis reporter Amanda Chicago Lewis about reefer madness, the whole dang concept, the old movie, the newer movie, this latest book. So yeah, episode four of the show, if you're interested in more on cannabis and madness and myths and reality in that space. How do you respond to somebody, you know, basically like resting on that stereotype or sort of seeking to advance it further? Like, how should we be thinking about the relationship between psychosis, psychotic disorders, people diagnosed with them, and violence? I mean, that's, I think, one kind of positive thing about the Andy McPhee character um, from that show and that time was that she was considered so... Uh, high functioning and so uh, so positive. I mean, she she's the one who like is so morally upright, and she's the one who also has mental illness. Um, not that we should uh, look at people who uh, have mental illness as uh, needing to uh, I don't know be all of those things right. or to be perfect in order to justify their existence or justify our existence. Um, but it's, it portrayed the example of psychosis or whatever she was experiencing um, with Tim as something that somebody of that type could experience as opposed to say, some kind of uh, evil character um, who lived in the town, right. um, who was perhaps violent. Yeah, I, I know what you're saying here. Like Andy is, there's a lot of aspects of her that feel like they're trying to push back against our expectation um, of, of, of what a person must be if they have a diagnosis. <laughs> I mean, it, re it reminds me a lot of like, the kind of news stories these days that are like, here's this great thing this immigrant did, or like, here's this great <laughs> thing this migrant did, um, oh, boy. you know, and, and kind of like, you know, which is, you know, why should, why should we need to justify the existence of human beings? Um, but there is, there, there, there is an audience for those kinds of stories, um, unfortunately. And, uh, and that's what I think about when you ask that question about violence and uh, psychosis. Um, and I think yeah, that was in part what made my book so weirdly popular. Um, it was kind of telling a story that was not being told um, elsewhere. Um, and I, I think that a lot of people really, really liked the idea of this book being written by a fairly high functioning person. Um, diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder um, and, and wanted to share it, you know, with their family or their therapist or their psychiatrist, et cetera. Yeah. So. yeah. It is sometimes very easy to be very discouraged by what stuff is popular in this category. And I feel like a book that's sort of built on the premise that um, schizophrenia diagnosis equals violence is, is, uh, is, popular right now like it doesn't terribly surprise me but the popularity of your book makes me hopeful right that people are at least interested in hearing from you you know what i mean like that i think yeah. even even a couple maybe a generation or two ago um that's less the case but I, you know that is that is and isn't true you know you you have stuff going back like 
uh, and never promised you a rose garden. You know, so there there definitely is um, a long history of that. But yeah, I I guess I I just wondered, you know, um, when when I said that stat about the homicide rate, you reacted. Um, what would you like the public to know? Let's say someone's listening who's like, oh, I don't know anything about you know schizophrenia and violence. I don't know what I should think about that. Like, I know it's a complicated argument that you're making in your in your book, but um, what would you like people to know when it comes to how we should how we should think about that? Um, well, I mean, there's that statistic also about how people with mental illness are so much more likely to be victims of violence rather than yeah. to perpetrate violence. Um, yeah. and, and also just, um, I think something that's really important is to remember the humanity of people who experience psychosis. I mean, that's one of the big things that I try to look at in this essay that I wrote called Toward the Pathology with the Possessed, Mm -hmm. um, which is about um, how there's this kind of idea with the schizophrenia is that the person who is experiencing the psychosis or the schizophrenia is is somehow being possessed or they're hollowed out and replaced by something, Um, something evil, something bad, whether it's actually a demon or something of that nature or just this scary thing called schizophrenia or psychosis. Mm -hmm. Um, But whatever it is, it isn't John or whoever the person was. Um, It's there. It's very much the, the notion of, uh, of what that diagnosis means. And so therefore I think that idea makes the idea of that person committing violence uh, so much more popular. And it doesn't help that in uh, the, the media, like whenever uh, somebody with that diagnosis does do something violent, they make sure to mention the diagnosis as well. Yeah, absolutely. And there's been studies about the overrepresentation of people with severe mental illness diagnoses in, you know, local media, whatever, you know, reports about crime. There is, a, as you allude, like there's an there's an appetite for this. This is popular. Um, and I think it speaks so much to the really limited and ugly imagination that so many people who haven't had these kinds of experiences have about folks who have, you know, and to say that in a complicated mm-hmm. way. But there is a there is a severe uh, lack of imagination in this space, if, if that makes sense. Yes, yes. And I think it also helps people who are not diagnosed with these things um, to other the experience, because that way, you know, violence can stay far away. It can be um, the thing that these other people uh, do. Um, yeah. It can be, you know, um, in this other realm. Um, so. Yeah, and 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 it's almost in Dawson's Creek. It's like almost supernatural, right? The way that they're doing it. There's that sequence before where they've gone to a carnival and seen a psychic, and when Andy sits down to have her fortune told, the candle blows out, and the psychic is like, <clears throat> oh, you know, basically, I can't help you. And it's supposed to be really like ominous, and it's kind of like wow, you know, this is the way that, you know, this show feels comfortable allowing this character's story to unfold is it sort of has to be edged with, you know, that that horror. Yeah, very much so, because I don't recall that show particularly dabbling in much of the supernatural or, no. you know, uh, any other kind of uh, like mysticism otherwise. Yeah, it's like only for Andy. Yeah, which I think says a lot, you know, I think says a lot about sort of like how the viewers are being asked to see it, which is it's very othered. It's very like, ooh, you know, and, and that and that's so common, right, that that there is this reliance on these, you know, the topic of, of mental illness becomes something that we, you know, center a, a, a sort of like a scary plot around. Um, and it seems like that in turn, you know, would have a negative effect upon people who are actually struggling and or actually considering seeking treatment of some kind. If you've got these negative stereotypes that are sort of being like repeated by both fictional and, you know, quote unquote, non-fictional media out there. Yeah, which I think brings us to an interesting question for me, which is whether watching the storyline about Andy McPhee encouraged me to get help or so? dissuaded me, f- no, well, or dissuaded me from getting mm. help, um, mm-hmm. or um, or if it, ha- you know, if it had some kind of impact in my actual life, like what was that impact? Um, 
And uh, I actually, this is a question I've never thought about before. And I think, you know, I actually don't really know. I mean, um, I know that, you know, as I was saying before, I know that what I know what the show made me hope for, yeah. but I don't know what it actually made me think about myself. Um, I, you know, I I didn't I knew that I uh, did not have that kind of person in my life, um, but it also did seem very scary. Um, based, I, I I think that it did reinforce my ideas of uh, you know depression and medication and. All the world of um, entering uh, the mental health kind of uh, kind of realm to be very frightening. Uh, I think it reinforced all of that for me. I'm curious that the description of sort of wanting, you know, a Pacey on the other side of the door is really beautiful. And y- you have been and you you dedicate this book to your your partner and you've been together for uh, quite a while. And I just wondered, like, you know, young you wanted that sort of support, you know, from somebody. I'm sure there's many other people in your life as well who have shown you love and support through even really difficult times. And like, um, is it? Does it help? You know, does it does having does having someone like that, you know, make a make a real difference? Yeah, I mean, I think it. it yes, it does help. Um, I've dedicated um, both of my books to him. Um, it, it, the support system helps. It doesn't have to be a romantic partner. Um, it yeah. doesn't have to be uh, that kind of person. Um but there is a lot of research um, about, you know, for the schizophrenia, but also for different forms of mental illness, that having a support system is really important. And often that's family, but that can be, you know, a found family or a chosen family. It can be friends. Um, it, you know, the friends that I have uh, here where I live are so important to me. Um, so, yeah, it, in the end, um, I think I did find... Uh, that what the thing that I was looking for um, as I was watching this show. So our last segment on Mad Chat is called What's Helping Today? And it's where we each share something that is helping us today, whatever it is, big or small. Um, do you want to go first, Esme? What's helping today? Um, what's helping today is that I had this to do this morning. Um, I s- slept in this morning and, um, this is basically the first thing that I did. I usually have this whole morning routine and there are all these things that I do in the morning. Um, I actually didn't, uh, write this morning, um, because I was doing this. Um, but I think that having, you know, this podcast to record kind of gave my day this kick, um, kick off to kind of settle me in and have my brain going. Well, that's beautiful. Thank you. Um, and all uh, what's helping today, I wanted to say um, I, earlier I was a little nervous for this conversation and I uh, got out some of my nerves by playing piano and singing Rufus Wainwright songs. And I've been teaching, oh. like kind of relearning piano after a long absence over the last couple of years. And uh I, yeah, I've just been finding so much joy in uh, singing along with my, my, my good singing, my bad playing. Um, and so I, I just try to get the playing up to the point uh, of my singing and so I can finally get through a song. Esme, thank you so much for doing this. I, I had a ball. Yeah. I'm really grateful to you for taking the time. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Hey listeners, I wanted to quickly tell you about something very exciting that we have coming up, which is we are launching the Mad Chat Book Club. Watch out, Oprah. So our first book club meeting is going to be in one week, August 1, 8 p.m. Eastern on the Mad Chat Show Instagram Live. I will be leading a book club discussion. We will be talking about the collected schizophrenias, of course. I was an English teacher for years, actually, so I really miss diving into a text with a group of smart, engaged people. If you are interested in books, if you're interested in this book, I really hope you'll you'll show up and participate. Feel free to send us questions ahead of time if you want. You can email us, Mad Chat Show 
show at gmail.com. You can also DM us. We are Mad Chat Show on Instagram, Twitter, and we're on Facebook. So yeah, send your questions. Come to book club. Read the collected schizophrenias, of course. Really look forward to seeing you in a week. Mad Chat is produced by the one, the only, Lee Mengistu. Theme music by Lee Mengistu and her sister, Ruthie Williams. Our social media and community manager is Annie Mock. Do you have opinions? Want to chat with other listeners about the things we discussed on this episode? Follow us at Mad Chat Show on Twitter and on Instagram and consider joining our Facebook community. Show transcripts by Alex Kornakia. Find those and more resources and recommendations from me at madchatshow.com. I'm Sandy Allen, author of A Kind of Miraculous Paradise, a true story about schizophrenia, which should be available wherever you buy or borrow books. More about me at hellosandyallen.com. This is Mad Chat. Thanks for listening. Chat with you again in three weeks. Mad Chat. Next time on Mad Chat, I'll be chatting with poet and podcast host, my friend Sarah Kay, about... Killing Eve! Yes! Uh, We're going to talk about psychopathy and sociopathy and Sarah's take on empathy. I am so excited to get into Killing Eve. In the meantime, if you've not already read Sarah's poetry, watch Killing Eve. What are you doing if you haven't watched Killing Eve? It's so hot. I would give Sandra O my internal organs, like, if she needed them.